My name is Alan Kazarian. I am a senior scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory, and this is the beginning of my 38th year here. Well, it's quite interesting because it started in high school or before that, actually. And <clears throat> my mother and brother died last fall. And in cleaning out the house and the effects that they had, I found a clipping, a newspaper clipping. It was Student of the Week, and apparently when I was a senior at Cumberland High School, I was featured as the Student of the Week. And <clears throat> it was quite funny to read it because many of the things that are in there I actually did. Um, I have been <laughs> fondly referred to around here when my hair was long as Einstein, and they actually described me as an Einstein in the clip. And um, my life's ambition as stated there was to pursue biomedical research and that's what I've done. So it was quite surprising to me to read it and to see exactly where I ended up. It was because I switched schools um, my, I didn't fit into the new high school's rotation. So as a sophomore, I took senior physics. And, uh, <clears throat> and so not only, and the physics teacher apparently took a liking to me. And, but not only did I have to learn physics, but I also had to learn all the advanced math because I hadn't had the advanced math courses. And then on top of that, he recommended uh, there was a program at the high school with the University of Rhode Island to, for advanced high school students to come to the university on Saturdays and essentially take freshman science courses. So he signed me up for f freshman physics. So not only did I have to fight through it at high school, but I also did it at the... Um, level of a freshman <laughs> at the University of Rhode Island. And I survived it quite well. And it really turned me on. So, you know, it was through that nurturing that um, I became interested in science. Undergraduate work was done at Northeastern University, and I also got a master's degree at Northeastern at their marine lab at Nahant. My mentors, um, Doc Reiser and Trish Morse at Northeastern, and Dr. Ruth Turner, who had her full time a lab here at um, MBL at Harvard, at MCZ in Harvard. <coughs> um, they, their research and their leadership and mentorship um, kept me here and attracted me to the MBL in the first place. And so to be able to come back here, it was great. <clears throat> Trish Morse was um, born and raised in Woods Hole on School Street, on School Street. And so um, my association with the MBL started in the 60s, actually and uh, invertebrate courses. And um, I got to know Ami Sheltimer at Hui and uh, Howie Sanders and Fred Grassley. Um, Judy Grassley was an um, MBL person in the um, 70s. And so um, when in graduate school, the best place to go was the MBL. And so I came. <laughs> never left, <laughs> never left. Um, I received an NIH postdoctoral fellowship to work in the Laboratory of Biophysics um, section on neural systems, and it was an intramural NIH lab, so I was actually an NIH 
uh, employee at the time, and Dr. Daniel Alcon was the director of our section. Well, actually, um, I came to Dan Alcon's lab because I, of the model organism that he, they were using. They were using the um, neuterbrank mollusks, the sea slug Hermesenda crassicornis, and my PhD was on neuterbranks and neuterbrank uh, taxonomy, histology, physiology, and so I came to the lab and brought my skill sets of invertebrate zoology and uh, functional morphology. And I learned neurobiology on the job training, as it were. So I became an invertebrate neurobiologist. And I wouldn't ever call myself a behaviorist. I just used behavior in order to study the aspects of learning that we were using. And so, because I was, I was always rather suspicious of some psychologists, especially when it related to behavioral studies, to get too anthropomorphic. And so, yeah, what's been remarkable is that, you know, I came here for a postdoc and never left. And I, there are not too many people at the MBL that can say that. <laughs>
you turn the light on, the animal contracts his foot. There's only five cells in the eye and, and only 12 cells in the statusist or the balance organ. And so it's very easy to study those changes in those cells. And we know that they synaptically interact. And so my interest was in the physical alteration of the pathway with regard to learning and memory, and memory acquisition. Yeah. So, um, Dan Alcon is using some of the data that we did first with Hermosenda and they repeated it with mice and then we repeated it with rabbit and now um, it will go into clinical studies for Alzheimer's patients, which is what we were uh, looking for, because bryostatin selectively activates the isomer of PKC, the alpha form. And the alpha form of uh, PKC activates alpha secretase, which activates alpha amyloid precursor protein, and that's the soluble form, which is being able to it, being, it is able to be handled and um, <clears throat> dissolved and it doesn't form plaques. So the hypothesis is that we can slow down the process of plaque formation in Alzheimer's by diverting the chemical pathway, not to gamma and to, and to beta uh, amyloid precursor, but to the soluble alpha form. And so that's the nature of the clinical trials. Yeah. So I give a lot of lectures um, to the elder hostel people through Road Scholar Program. And the questions I get is, when is it going to be available? <laughs> you know, can you give me some? And sometimes it, I, I'll be 70 this year. Sometimes I wonder <laughs> if it's, you know, might help. Cause at this age, you start to lose the nouns. Nouns go first, I found out. So, you know, a person's name or a name of a place or a molecule or something, nouns go first. <laughs> so I'm, I'm at that point where rapid acquisition of nouns is starting to get stuck. <laughs> so, Bryostatin. The techniques and things that I developed over the years, the, the things that I had done even tens of years ago, people come and they ask, you know, how, did you, how do you do this or do that? And <clears throat> so I'm able to pass that on, which is really great. And in fact, I was invited to Heidelberg in March. The friend of mine who was an NIH in the bioengineering, biomedical engineering department came, <clears throat> he came up with the idea. We were trying to, in neurobiology in the late 70s and in the 80s before the decade of the brain, we were trying to do 3D reconstructions of neural networks. And so the classic way is to take serial sections and then stack them up. We, I used to do it by doing drawings and then you do freehand drawings. Some people use, used to use camera lucida. You look through the microscope and you draw it out. <clears throat> and then you either cut it out or stack them up yourself physically. And then computers started to come. And then we got to have <clears throat> images through microscopy and then eventually they would become digitized. But before that, we had to do that all by hand. And so the bottleneck in collecting serial sections was cutting the sections and not losing them. And then secondarily was aligning each image with the next and the, and the previous one. So Steve Layton, um, came and is a summer investigator in Dan's lab. <clears throat> we got together and he, he had just put together and created this miniature ultramicrotome. The concept was to do serial imaging of the block face and not worry about the section. 
because the block stayed in the exact position to the electron beam and we were doing it in a scanning electron microscope and therefore registration even the computer programs could do it with because they were more or less aligned and so we called it um, a mini mini microtome and serial block face imaging and we worked for 10 years on it we got he had a patent on the microtome and then we had another patent on the technique and we tried to sell it to NIH and we tried to sell it to NSF and we tried to sell it to vendors but at the time we were doing it confocal microscopy was coming in right so oh, we can we don't have to physically section anymore we can do it <clears throat> visually right and we don't have to worry about registration and the computers will all do it in fact i think pilati was one of the reviewers on, on one of the grants and he said we don't need that anymore however in or somewhere around 2002 um, in the neurobiology course tom reese was there and we tried to get tom interested in it because he was doing freeze fracture stuff and you know this he could we could do it that way with serial block faced imaging but <clears throat> it with tom you never knew what sunk in and what didn't you know but anyway i <clears throat> um my office in mrc and right next door was the neurobiology lecture room and so one day in july um after the course broke for lunch tom reese came into my office <clears throat> and there were several people behind him and he pointed at me and he said you need to talk to this guy because he has the technique to do what you need and it was Winford Denk and Winford Denk was here as a uh, lecturing in the neuroanatomy portion of the neurobiology course he was at Max Planck Heidelberg and <clears throat> he we spent a couple of hours and I showed him the mini microtome because it's still here. It's, it's in, in Central Microscopy Facility. And he talked with Steve Layton <clears throat> and he made draw, drawings and took photographs and he took it back to Mac Planck. And they had a lot of money <clears throat> and they actually made it work. And the other thing that we ran into was that um, the scanning scopes were not advanced enough. Um, now, and so, you didn't have variable KV, and you didn't have variable pressure, and everything had to be coded, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> anyway, he made it work, and now Gatan sells it. So there was a workshop in Heidelberg on correlative microscopy and serial block-faced imaging. And so I said, I'll come if you want to actually know the history of how it formed, right? And so they invited me to come, and paid part of my way, MBL paid the other, and so I gave the history of it. And one of the people in the group, because the Europeans have adopted the technique more so than here. I, we're still stuck on confocal and two photon stuff, and, and which Winford Dink also invented. But <clears throat> it was rather gratifying. She said, you know, whether you know it or not, you changed like my microscopy with SBFI, and we're all grateful that you did it. <laughs> and so that was kind of cool, because you know it was it was really <laughs> difficult to sell the idea. People understood it and stuff, but you know <clears throat> they just couldn't put it all together. And now they're using it all the time. And it's really, it was very uh, enlightening to see how far they've taken it. So it was cool. Uh, I described science in my own description. <clears throat> There's two groups of, quote, scientists. One group of scientists focus on a problem and they pull in whatever they need to and they just stick to one particular problem. 
Um, and then there's the other group of which I think I'm a member in that you develop a, a certain skill set of tools and of thinking and, and techniques, right? And to me, the excitement was applying that skill set to answer different problems in different organisms. And so <clears throat> that's, that's what kept me here at MBO. It is, the MBO is a unique place as a marine lab. Marine labs are not s academic institutions, really. Um, I was fortunate to be the founding secretary treasurer of the, of the National Association of Marine Laboratories that was founded by Harlan Halverson when he was director here. And for 24 years I did that. And so, the, the ability of investigators from very diverse fields to come together into one place and to have the free exchange of ideas and being sh openly sharing of these ideas um, is unique to the MBL. And that's what kept me here. Because as the institution grew, so did I in knowledge and in experience and in the ability to teach and to mentor um, other individuals. And that's been very pleasing to me. And I th I'm very thankful to have been able to do it <laughs> and to be here for as long as I have.